shortly introduce um, the final speaker of the conference, Professor Thomas Alzester, whose career has been so long and distinguished that I think um, it could be the topic of its own um, keynote presentation. Um, his contribution to the field um, has of course been enormous, both in terms of his own work, uh, but also how he has facilitated the work of others. Out of the long list of publications um, that you can choose from to highlight, um, I would single out, um, in the light of this conference, um, his groundbreaking work on uh, new film history, which of course uh, signified a return to the archive um, and a focus on archival primary source material more generally. Um, it has meant a lot to me personally, um, and I've discussed it for many hours with my PhD supervisor, Michael Punt, who of course in turn was uh, Professor Alsesser's uh, PhD student. Um, Professor Alsesser is uh, the founding father uh, of, of many film studies programs uh, around the world uh, on, on uh, various continents. Um, and not, uh, not only one, uh, but of two um, archival programs. So not only did he play a, a crucial role in uh, the MA film archiving um, at the University of East Anglia in the UK, but he then went to the University of Amsterdam, where amongst other things, um, he was um, the founder of the MA in preservation and presentation of the moving image. Um, and that's arguably one of the uh, the strongest and uh, most important programs uh, around today. This program recently celebrated its uh, 15th anniversary earlier this year um, at, the, at the annual conference at I, and uh, by now there are virtually hundreds of alumni of, of that program um, at work in uh, academia, museums, and, and archives worldwide. Uh, another line on his uh, distinguished CV is, is now filmmaker, as well, uh, of which we'll, uh, we'll hear and see uh, much more later. Uh, but first, uh, we will hear uh, from him in the keynote address, and I have a different title here than you have yes, just changed. Yes, I'm afraid I tried to um, change it back. So it was called New Materialities of Memory, yes. but um, I'm going to leave it over to you uh, explaining you. Why, yes. why that changed. Right. Enjoy. I couldn't cope with the, um, the, the keyboard, uh, the Turkish keyboard. Thank you very much, Tyreen, for the introduction. I'm uh, most grateful uh, to have been invited uh, to, to speak at this conference. Uh, I'm especially grateful, of course, to Nesik uh, Edouard, who managed to bring me here uh, at short notice as well. Not at short notice, but at least uh, uh, from another conference in Rome. Um, and uh, obviously I'm also very pleased to see so many familiar faces. Um, uh, my former, I'll just all mention it, uh, people here who were my students. Peter Rory mentioned that he was my student. Melis is here. Uh, Nessie himself, uh, I remember. So uh, it's quite a moving occasion for me. Um, and also it is always uh, a special occasion when I present and introduce my own films. So, let me see whether this works here. Yeah. In 2007, through circumstances not entirely of my own choosing, I found myself resurre resurrecting a family ancestor, that is my grandfather, Martin L. Sasser. I was asked to write a biographical essay for a catalogue accompanying a retrospective of his work at the Deutsche Architektur Museum Frankfurt. This was the uh, exhibition and the catalogue. The exhibition honoured him as one of the chief city architects in Frankfurt between 1925 and 1932, during the peak years of what came to be called Das Neue Bauen. So here you see Martin Elsesser uh, on Das Neue Frankfurt, which is a subcategory of Das Neue Bauen. His key building from the period the Frankfurt Central Market had been acquired by the European Central Bank in 2004 as the site of the bank's new headquarters. Although a listed building and therefore protected as a national monument, the 
Großmarkthalle, the central market, was under threat. The plans envisaged by the central bank and uh, its notoriously deconstructive architect, here are the plans, and here is the architect, um, meant that the integrity of the building, you can see that, the integrity of the building, and thus its value, see, again, have a look at this here, the integrity of the building and its value as a historical landmark had to be sacrificed. The general context of the retrospective then was as much an act, an act of compensation or restitution as, as it was of celebration and recognition. The temporary nature of the exhibition and the online existence of the foundation, I mean, uh, this is the destruction that was wreaked on it, uh, the foundation, the online existence of the foundation, which uh, when you see the film you realize how it came about, had to substitute for the physical survival of the architect's most famous building. Already a paradox there. To assist the curators of the exhibition, I had gone through my father's family albums and photo collections in search of visual material that could illustrate my grandfather's life. That's when I came across my father's whole movies from the 1940s, which we saw as children projected on a makeshift screen in our living room. Remembering that some of these featured my grandfather, I managed to edit together two seven-minute video loops these home movies proved a major attraction for the visitors, even though the, the time, that is, of the home movies, was 10 years after my grandfather's Frankfurt period, the 20s and early 30s, and the place appeared to be his summer house on an island near Berlin. Tasked with establishing a Martin Elsasser archive and with promoting the foundation, I decided the whole movies might make a film that commemorates his life to complement the scholarly focus on his work in the catalogue and other publications that we undertook as a foundation. As a historian with a predilection for early cinema and also with some knowledge of German cinema, I had already published and, and ha having already published on non-theatrical films industrial films and instructional films, I thought this might be something I am capable of. I also had written uh, about Harun Faraki's Respite, Aufschub, uh, a found footage re reconstruction of life in a Nazi deportation camp in the Netherlands in 1944. And I had reflected on um, this kind of found footage in several other articles. But when I began thinking about making a film, I oriented myself more by the personal documentaries embedded in larger histories, for, for instance, those of Ross McElwee, Sherman's March and Bright Leaves, and Alan Berliner, uh, Nobody's Business and the Family Album, whom I got to know in New York. I also studied Sue Friedrich's Sink or Swim and Nathan Nathaniel Kahn's my architect, as well as Doug Block's 51 Birch Street. don't know how well known these films are, but they are indeed quite interesting and moving. These films by professional directors and visual artists made me quickly realize that there was no way I was going to turn myself into a filmmaker. So I decided that I wasn't a filmmaker, I just needed to make a film. <laughs> the problem I did not have a story, or rather I had two stories that had little to do with each other, one set in Frankfurt in the present and centred on the fate of my grandfather's landmark building, on the subsequent lawsuit, the protests, the out-of-court settlement, the exhibition and the setting up of the foundation, some of which you will see in the film. And this other story, or other stories, which may or may not be hidden in the two hours worth of uncut whole movie material 
mostly shot between 1940 and 1944, and set in, around, uh, in and around Berlin, and taken by my father. These other stories involve not just my grandfather. Here he is on this island, and you can already see that he doesn't actually fit in terribly well, sitting there in his three-piece suit in the in, um, glass house. Not, not just my grandfather, but also my grandmother. And indeed, some other characters. My father, his two sisters, his younger brother, and my future mother, and her brother, and their mother. Overshadowing these members of my extended family was another person, also an architect, and my grandmother's great love and longtime lover, a man called Leberecht Miger. Anxiety over my family centered self indulgence in making this film was aggravated by the fear of indiscretion, of betraying the dead rather than rescuing them. Feelings which I tried to keep at bay by persuading myself that there was and there were, would be extenuating circumstances and mitigating factors that had indeed forced my hand. After all, it was me who set out to make a film. It was circumstances that obliged me to do something for the Martin Elsa Foundation. First, amongst these extenuating circumstances, was that both my grandfather, but entirely thanks to the European Central Bank's controversial plans for their acquisition, and my grandfather, grandmother's lover, rediscovered uh, as one of the fathers of the Green Movement um, in Germany because of his fervent advocacy of urban gardening, of waste recycling, and ecological sustainability, that these two characters had attained a certain topicality. And indeed, the reason that I managed to find a producer and a television co-producer was because of the topicality of the European and the controversiality of the European Central Bank's acquisition of the, the Großmark Tunnel. So because they had attained a certain topicality, I felt emboldened to actually take the liberty of making this film. The second reason was that my grandmother, another protagonist, perhaps deserved a place in posterity and in the public domain, precisely because she is just one of the many women from the first half of the 20th century who were instrumental in bringing about changes in all kinds of fields, but who have remained in the shadow of their more famous, but also of their more fallible men. For her, the posthumous, and this is why I introduced the term posthumous in my title, the posthumous comes as a way of making amends, or in the words of Hannah Arendt, I quote, such posthumous fame is the lot of the unclassifiable ones, those whose work neither fits the existing order nor introduces a new genre that lends itself to future classification. So it's the unclassifiable nature of my grandmother's contribution and indeed the legacy that she's left us with, namely her letters that inspired me ultimately to um, make this film, or at least to set out making this film. There she is. Even though not conceived as an essay film in the manner of, let's say, Chris Marker or Harun Faraki, I still wanted to sustain a personal point of view that relied less on the single voice embodied in the obligatory off-screen commentary, but instead present a subjectivity that was more manifest uh, in the tonality uh, of a tentative exploration, a kind of quest in the cautious steps moving forward across pre briefly glimpsed tra traces of these past events, while nonetheless interrogating the historical footage, that is the whole movies, uh, in a way that I call um, archival, or uh, um, as I now like to speak of it, as the fossil record of the 20th century. Yet, I wanted to let the images speak about what they wanted to say, or indeed what they carefully tried to hide. I did not want to force them. But I also intended to question the epistemological status of home movies, 
and a whole movie scenes, whether caught on the fly or carefully staged. I, in other words, I wanted to interrogate their true status and evidentiary force. I wanted to involve the spectator in this process of discovery and reflection, as well as borrow the essay film's constitutive reflexivity and self-reference. Reflexivity in that I'm not just showing these images because they evoke a bygone age or present my family as, to, as if still alive. I am re re representing this footage for a purpose, even if I, at, at the outset I wasn't quite sure what this purpose was. And self-reference, because these images are the material residue of an act of filming itself at the time inflected by intention and purpose, and not pretending to deliver transparent access to the reality they protect, project, uh, or open a window on the world as it once was, and that is now lost forever. In other words, I was careful to not fully indulge the nostalgic impulse, nor did I want to pass them off as bona fide reliable documents, uh, but at the same time, I was also aware that there was an intentionality which may no longer be available to me and which it may be my, may be my task to at least speculate on. The editing phase of the film was productive but also painful in that it made me focus on the differences between documentary, essay film and home movie, as well as between making a film for myself and making a film for te the German television. And it obliged me to think more critically about the relation between today's film culture and practical filmmaking, as the distinction between amateur and professional has become less a matter of craft and inspiration and more a matter of capital and resources, less about access to tools and technology and more about access to institutions and to insiders. In short, when, thanks to digital software and the internet, everyone in principle can be a filmmaker, or indeed, as I did, upload his work or her work on Vimeo, what is an author, what is art, and what is self-advertising. Acting on behalf of the Martin Elsesser Foundation, where you can now buy a DVD of the film, uh, acting on, the, on behalf of the Martin Elsesser Foundation to promote its goals, my task was to access the institutions, which is to say television, and through television, try and reach the public sphere and not to claim avant-garde status or to expect alter treatment. Um, basically saying that in the process of editing and making a film with a professional producer, many of my ideas uh, to make an e essay film had to be sacrificed to more practical and indeed commercial considerations. But it'll be up to you to see whether you can still find traces of this other concept. The lieu de mémoire and historical topographies with where we come to the materialities of memory. If now, after many screenings of the film and after its television broadcast, I return once more to the external circumstances and the posthumous constellation that made me make the Sun Island, it is to resume my role as a film historian and theorist. On the face of it, the Sun Island belongs to the by now almost cliché genre of the family film. Uh, sorry, this is the television broadcast, I should have shown that. So it had, it had its television broadcast in April 2018. So on the face of it, the Sun Island belongs to the, uh, uh, the family film where sons or daughters make a film about their fathers, mothers or parents. And these two films I've already mentioned fit the genre. Uh, by sifting through home movies, letters, and family albums that have come down to the, the sons or daughters. Often in such films, the memory of the dead becomes a mirror for the filmmaker's fragile egos to study who they are, to ponder the roads not taken, or to reflect on identity politics, their ethnicity, their background, and so on. We are a culture mindful of our precariousness, fearful for our future, and are forever searching for roots. Yet for this self-scrutiny or self-affirmation, we increasingly draw on audiovisual records and audiovisual sources as the lived embodiment 
and the visible complement to the genes, the bloodlines, and DNA that biologically bind us to past generations. So, in one sense, these whole movies are very close now to biological uh, material. On the other hand, the quest for roots and personal identity is in turn, in, in turn embedded, especially in Europe, in the general memory discourse, which in Germany is inescapably shaped by and caught up in the various mastering the past, Vergangenheitsbewältigung cultures of commemoration, which began in the 1970s, but were taking off in earnest after reunification in 1990. And while in my case there was no quest for personal identity that initiated the film, it would have been foolish for, for me not to own up to the memory and identity discourses that the Sun Island now finds itself part of. Indeed, one of the outcomes of the give and take between the producer and myself was that the film became ever more personal, even autobiographical, fully cognizant of the fact that it had to be the family film genre which would serve as the matrix of recognition by which a German television audience could make effective and interpretive contact with the Sun Island. Now, one of the strongest discourses of memory and remembrance since the 1990s has been Pierre Nora's notion of lieu de mémoire. On a much, so on, and I would say on a much smaller scale, both tempor temporally and geographically, but partly inspired by Nora, I tried in the Sun Island to reconstruct, but the, in the end, possibly to invent the memory map of an île de mémoire, an island of memory, based on this actual island located not far from Berlin, where, to quote Marina Warner and her project of memory maps, ecology and stewardship are interconnected with memory and stories. So this particular île de mémoire appears to Google Maps uh, like this, and from the air, by drone like this, as a site of pristine nature. But it turns out to have been a site that bears its own scars of memory and traces of a once-lived history. So that's the, that was the challenge. You see an island just anywhere, nothing at all special, and yet, as I will try and show in my film, buried are uh, extraordinary aspects of German history. In the course of plotting and recording these slow cycles of regenerative destruction, I discovered several other cycles of value creation and value destruction, binding together nature and culture. It turned out that the photographs, the letters, the administrative records, sorry, the administrative records, and whole movies from which I had to piece together the story of the Sun Island, both metaphorically and literally, prolonged this transfer of decay and regeneration, insofar as especially my father's whole movies and my grandmother's letters gave another twist to the human history-natural history interface when I began to restore decaying celluloid, film stock, and had to decipher Gothic script this is how the letters looked, and um, almost all of us are now challenged to make any sense of it. In fact, we had to train somebody and pay them substantial amounts to run the site of the letters. Digitizing both the images and the letters added another layer to the value exchange. The gain in legibility was a loss in authenticity, and yet it is invariably the intervention of a new technology that confers added value to an object's obsolescence. And my book on media archaeology speaks a lot about that process of obsolescence or what happens to obsolescence. Now, the Sun Island as Lieu de Mémoire is intimately linked to another historical topography, Berlin. Berlin has engaged its own cultural memory and engendered uh, a plethora of uh, books on that topic. And this cultural memory is made up of images and music, of buildings and ruins, of cliches and discoveries, of fictions and critical discourses. As almost everyone writing about the city notes, um, 
It is a very peculiar kind of chronotope. Forget Berlin, that was Lutz Köpnik's exhortation to German study scholars making the spatial turn exploring sites of memory in 2001. But can one really forget Berlin? Few cities have been as indelibly marked by and have been as resilient in the face of historical trauma as Berlin. And let's face it, few have had to be. So that, that is something that uh, um, I was very aware of, this chronotope Berlin as being adjacent to the story that I was trying to construct. In fact, ever since the 19th century, Berlin has, had, has, has been a city of multiple temporalities and of diverse modalities. It's been virtual and actual, divided and united, created and destroyed, repaired and rebuilt. Living in a perpetual mise-en-scene of its own history, a history it both needs and fears, it both reinvents and disowns, Berlin is a city of superimpositions and erasures, full of ghosts and special effects that are the legacy of Nazism and Stalinism, obliged to remember totalitarian crimes while still mourning socialist utopias. What Marina Warner presumably also means by stewardship, and it applies with singular force to film one of the most physically fragile and yet imaginatively powerful archives of evidentiary presence. This stewardship uh, is a form of trust, nowhere more so than in my instance, where most of the materials, I already mentioned that, that I depended on for the Sun Island do not belong in the public domain but are in every sense private property. Not only is the island private property, which I trespassed when filming there, but the home movies and amateur photographs, which I complemented by drawing on this personal correspondence, um, on these love letters and even poems, concern public persons at moments when they were at their most intensely private and indeed also at their most vulnerable. Yet the realities they document also belong to a collective history insofar as these letters and movies, these literary and photographic tokens of friendship and of rivalry, of courtship and of passion, of tragedy and trauma, are also the only extant evidence and testimony of an experiment in living differently. Migas project, Liberate Migas project of urban self-sufficiency, of refuse cycling and of a maintenance and sustainability economy that was meant to be emulated, to be propagated and to be made public. In both inspiration and location and implementation, the island experiment, you can just see a Berlin on the top left uh, is Berlin Mitte, and at the, the bottom right, where it says Donnelval, if you can just see it, is where the island is located. So it's just at the border between Berlin and Brandenburg. There's a history to that that we can talk about later, but I just wanted to mark that. So, so uh, uh, the island experiment belong, belongs to the history of Berlin and uh, the history of German modernism, to the extent that one family's filmic memories can mutate and metamorphose into a historical topography. It is partly this historicity and the peculiarity uh, of uh, the acts of symbolic transfer and material immaterial exchange, which in my context with the producer over the film's form of structure and narrative arc, persuaded me that it was ultimately in the film's best interest not to insist on making the sort of essay film I once imagined and had even sketched out in my synopsis and expose. Instead, it is worth examining more closely the original discourse and practice into which my father's films inscribed themselves before they became the Sun Island, namely that of the home movie. Here then are some of the defining criteria and my reflections uh, as well as the points of contention that arise when home movies are re-edited, repurposed, and represented. The first question to pose is, how do we identify and recognize a home movie? Roger Audin, probably the world's foremost scholar of home movies, puts it crisply 
and succinctly. I quote, nothing resembles a home movie as much as another home movie. The same ritual ceremonies, marriage, birth, family meals, gift giving, the same daily scenes, a baby in his mother's arms, a baby having a bath, the same vacation sequences, playtimes on the beach, walks in the forest, appear across most home movies. End of quote. Now in this respect, the footage left to me by my father answers very precisely to this description. He'd recorded family meals, several birthdays, and different leisure pursuits. Prominent, as you will see, are the boccia games, so beloved by my grandfather, a volleyball game when my father's work colleagues came for the weekend. And as for playtime on the beach, there is this frolicking uh, on, uh, on the lake, uh, caught in glorious Kodak color by a camera at water level. Regarding a baby in his mother's arms, even that I can supply, and a baby having a bath you will see in the film. These scenes too are duly present. So it is as if Audin was describing my father's films. But that's exactly the point he's making. He has seen them, that is my father's films, because once you've seen one, you've seen them all. Second issue, who makes a home movie? Audin also offers a defi definition of the home movie as a family film. As you saw, the, the French title for home movies is film de famille, family film. Namely, I quote, a film that, uh, a family film, that his definition for him is a film that is contrived to function within the space of familial communication. It is made by one member of the family for the other members of the family about the history of the family, end of quote. This too applies to my father's material. 70% of what I have takes place in what's shot on the island. About 10% is about skiing trips in the Alps, nothing but whiteness, and the rest are indoor scenes at other locations. Where my father's home movies differ is that traditionally it is the father who, who films his own family and thereby affirms, consolidates, or enforces his own authority. In my case, however, it was the son who filmed the family, and once he had his own family, he actually lost interest in filming. As it happens, the island was a matriarchal space, and my grandfather, the father figure who should have been behind the camera, had already given up or lost his paternal authority. The reasons you will see in the film. But who makes home movies also points to another factor. In the 1930s and 1940s, which is the period we're talking about, portable cine cameras were still a luxury item, making home movies of that period indicators of a well-to-do bourgeois family. This is evidently the case with my grandfather, a renowned if unemployed and unemployable architect to the time, during the time in question. Yet his son, a passionate photographer, owner of an expensive Rolleiflex camera since his 50, 15th birthday, here you see the Rolleiflex camera and the, uh, the Cine camera that he was using. Yet his son, my, my future father, seems to have acquired the Cine camera quite late only once he had settled in his first real job and was earning a salary. Since then, of course, that is since then the 40s, the class index of home movies has all but vanished. The advent of video and the camcorder meant that anyone can and does make home movies, which may or may not affect their value as documents for future generations. The arrival of more affordable equipment and the exponential increase in the quantity of amateur film has given their celluloid-based precursors, such as those standard eight film strips of my father's from the 1940s, an extra distinction of scarcity value, quite apart from the fact that they were silent witnesses or unwitting observers of one of the 20th century's most momentous and catastrophic historical decades. After the camcorder, the mobile phone, this latest shift in technology, taking movies with your smartphone, not only makes of home movies a corpus so vast that no human and only machines 
can keep track of their proliferation. Uh, like YouTube is basically a machine. It also confers on home movies from these earlier technologies yet another value, that of obsolescence, which registers as a precious materiality, a guarantee of authenticity and a promise of pristine veracity, all gained through hindsight and subject to the posthumous. Who speaks in home movies and who is being addressed? I've long puzzled over this question. Whom do my father's home movies actually address? Again, Odin is quite clear and categorical. In home movies, the family speaks to itself about itself. They are entirely self-referential. But inside the self-reference, and this is just paraphrasing here, it's not quote, but inside the self-reference, there are nuances and enigma, enigmas, tensions and even contradictions. In my father's case, it is possible and even likely that different events and circumstances occasion the individual pieces of footage, because with some notable exceptions, all of which I use in the Sun Island, the films are neither edited nor do they follow a discernible narrative arc. Again, Audin offers a persuasive explanation. And now I quote, let me have the quote here. Yeah. To function well, the family film needs to be compiled as a non-organized succession of shots that present mere snippets of family life so that each member is free to construe the family story in their own way while sharing a reconstruction of the family story with the other members. In summary, the family film must not have an author, if it is to allow the family to speak across itself. This is its ideological function, to produce a consensus in order to perpetuate the family. I think this is an extraordinarily important passage. I shall come back, if maybe in the discussion, to the question of authorship, but what cannot be emphasized enough is that in my case, the son and not the father shot the films. For a long time, therefore, I thought he, had, he used the island and the family as a mere pretext, because what really fascinated him was the wind-up cine camera he had acquired, that is, the machine itself, and what he could do with the apparatus, especially given that he was an engineer by profession and a bricoleur by passion. In the film, I point out that this may have predic predicated uh, him for making home movies, the bridge being montage in its original meaning. However, this does not exhaust the possibilities of whom the home movies address. In the Sun Island, for instance, I tentatively make the case that my father used his camera to woo his future wife, who at that time was still nurturing the hurt of a broken engagement. As her letters attest, she was more attracted to the dashing writer who occasionally visited the island with his wife, and even to Sebastian, 11 years her junior, that is, the youngest brother of my father, than she was to my father, whom she considered socially inept, chaotic, and nerdy. <laughs> Three of the plainly staged films are meant to win her over. One paints the idyll of a couple in love, the other shows them enjoying the domestic bliss of getting up in a, on a sunny morning in their joint apartment, and the third has the two of them sharing Sunday brunch on the island. So while making the film, yet another possibility uh, of uh, a, an addressee imposed uh, herself, the short instruction films I call docu-manuals, uh, and which show Leberecht Mieger's patented set, settlement implements, the tent hut, the cold frames, compost seat, silo, and um, dry toilet, are clearly meant to honor my grandmother's dead lover, and are therefore addressed to her, that is, my father's mother, by way of document, homage, and monument. At once very personal gifts, the historical value of these sequences is nonetheless considerable, since they confirm that the Sun Island was indeed an experimental laboratory station and not just a love nest during the 30s and a refuge during the 40s. So what is the documentary status and value of home movies? Given the cliché situations and the repetitions of events, the direct informational value of home movies would seem to be low. 
how home movies are little like dreams. They're fascinating or troubling to the dreamer, in this case the members of the family, but they're tediously repetitive and inconsequential to anyone outside. Yet the world at large, not just, film, not just film historians, seem to have recognized the documentary value of home movies in a variety of ways. To be noted is the remarkable migration of home movies and amateur filmmaking from the attics, the shoeboxes and flea markets, to film archives, special collections, and institutions expressly set up to preserve such materials. One can easily list some two dozen archives in France, Germany, Belgium, Britain, the United States, but also Cambodia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, that now specialize in home movies and amateur films. The same archival impulse animates institutions dedicated to regional history. Important centers of home movie collections in the UK, for instance, uh, are the East Anglia Film Archive, or the Northwest Film Archive in Manchester, or the Scottish Film Council. Then there is a special urgency to preserve amateur film in countries that have suffered historical disasters, civil wars, genocide, ethnic cleansing, which may explain the existence of this particular archive, the Audiovisual Resource Centre in Phnom Penh, set up by the filmmaker Riti Pan, his country's foremost director of films about cultural memory and national trauma. Now, in the case of Cambodia, as, as in many other countries one could name, an interest in the archiving of amateur film and home movies may well be guided by the need to possess non-canonical representations and thereby also to collect non-official sources of information. These often serve in the salvage or construction of a counter-memory, which in turn can be a powerful instrument in uncovering forgotten, repressed or obliterated events in the lives of nations or individuals. More than oral testimony and less than evidence before a court of law, such documents have a potency of their own when enlisted in struggles for minority rights or restorative justice after civil wars or religious or ethnic conflicts. So one of the, the reasons um, why there has been such an interest in home movies is that epitaphs such as alternative, resisting, anti, counter, lend themselves quite readily for this corpus in line with a more general tendency of activating the archive, which is what this conference earlier this year that uh, Claudia also attended and just referred to uh, uh, was there to uh, uh, highlight. But home movies are the Sunday edition. An equally productive approach to locating the political significance, however, might be to dwell on the discrepancy so typical of home movies between what is in the picture and what is kept off frame. <coughs> this can be extremely frustrating to the historian and the archivist, so much so that many professionals dismiss home movies as unreliable or even highly misleading evidence. Yet the discrepancy can also offer unexpected benefits, since these gaps, once recognized as gaps, create openings in other directions. Quite generally, the intense public interest in home movies, in family histories, found footage, vintage postcards, and uh, uh, old photographs is not only due to a nostalgic appetite for a past we always imagine more authentic than the present, or to the hope of recovering there the voices of the silenced and the oppressed. It also signals the broader cultural shift already mentioned in favor of audiovisual uh, rather than written documents as physical evidence for this past. We are now so used to having everything that matters recorded and stored in sound and images that the written word, along with the material world, increasingly comes to be seen and to be used as corroborating illustrations of the audiovisual record. Gone is the time when images were regarded as merely the representation of a pre-existing reality of which they were expected to be the faithful and truthful servants. What we witness is an almost ontological switch which depends quite clearly on a different set of default values. The visual record will be preferred for its special qualities of self-evidence, of immediacy, of presence and authenticity. 
But these qualities are, of course, not necessarily historical or indeed epistemological. They are primarily aesthetic. Once we accept that whole movies euphemize, select, and filter, we can look for their truth somewhere other than in their representational veracity. They force us to shift from a realist paradigm to a different hermeneutic strategy. We need to develop special skills to read and interpret the visual record, perhaps especially in the case of whole movies and other non-canonical materials from the archives and the attics. As again Audin puts it, quote, it is always possible that a film of minor importance can suddenly become a fabulous document when the historical context of reading changes. End of quote. If we are indeed in the aesthetic regime, as Jacques Francier would claim, new frames of reference come into view. First of all, any reviewing of home movies made 70 years ago, even prior to any editing and compilation by subsequent generations, constitutes a reframing, just the fact of showing it makes a reframing. Secondly, such reframing requires a hermeneutics that not only, re not only reads what is there to, in light of hindsight and present preoccupations, but also interprets its absences as having their own kind of presence. Correspondingly, the challenge for the curator filmmaker when reframing whole movies in his or her own work is to make silences become eloquent, but not to fill them with words or more images. A reading against the grain, a reading that engages the whole movie or amateur film in what it does not say outright, means listening to what it cannot say, but nonetheless gives away or conjures up through absence. Now, the, the, the Sun Island tries to be mindful of this challenge. For instance, the description of a horrific night of firebombing in Berlin and an equally horrific incident of shot down British soldiers, uh, sorry, British pilots being left to rot in the sun on a Berlin square runs parallel with images of morning gymnastics on the island. More generally, the war, as indeed the entire Nazi regime, seems to be happening off screen and must be inferred from scant mention in the letters and a few words of commentary, such as the observation that we are in the third year of the war and that women now do men's work, while we see three women in headscarves and aprons sew logs and chop firewood. This virtual absence of the signs of Nazi rule and the war's invisible presence on the island is both faithful to the material, there is no extant footage among my father's films of military parades or street scenes with jubilant crowds giving the Nazi salute. And it is a deliberate aesthetic choice, hard fought for in my confrontation with the producers. I have been criticized for this, also by audiences, notably in Germany, though not in New York or Tel Aviv. The main argument is that I'm too soft on my family, who seems to have survived the war unscathed, and that I do not press them too hard or come clean about their political views. I, men I merely mentioned that one son was part of the occupying forces in Paris, that the daughters were in the compulsory Reich labor service, that the family's writer friend was killed by a partisan sniper in Italy, that my father served a few weeks in a communication battalion on the Czech-Polish border, and that my grandfather was drafted into the Volkssturm, the local militia, in the last months of the war, and spent time as a Soviet prisoner. Where is the Kristallnacht? Where are the Jews brutally pulled out of their Berlin homes? Where is Auschwitz? They ask, that is, the Germans. Not in my father's films, I'm obliged to answer. Let each member of the audience draw their own conclusions, for it was my experience while making the Sun Island that home movies give away most when one lets them speak in their own idiom. And much of this idiom, as Odin reminds us, is celebratory in tone and tenor. All right, with this, I would like to well, invite you to watch the film.
Thank you. Um, to see you as a filmmaker, even though you say you're not, is a very interesting experience. Maybe just a few sort of more practical questions to get the ball rolling. Um, I was wondering how much of the films you have you used? I mean, how many hours did you have in terms of family uh, films, uh, home movies? And also, I realize that you're visible. I mean, you're visible in terms of your voice throughout the whole film, obviously, but you're visible physically only in the very beginning of the film, and then we never actually see you after you visit the home on the island. Uh, how much of that is coincidence, or did you want to just sort of vanish from the film? If you could expand on that. Yes, um, th yes, thank you, Melis, for, for those questions. Um, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier that the, the, the total uh, length of the material is two hours, and I guess I probably used about 40 minutes of it. So um, it's a fairly small percentage. There's more on the island. Um, there's uh, a very dramatic scene of flooding, and there's more about the animals. So um, just for reasons of time, and also to keep uh, a certain narrative tension going that I left quite a lot of the material, which is visually very interesting, but I had to use it out. Um, as I said, um, the, the film was not meant to, my, when, I, when I was first thinking about the film, I wasn't even speaking the commentary. Uh, I was much more thinking of the way that Chris Marker you know, made it indirect, and uh, I wanted far less commentary as well. Making a film for German television means you have to be fairly didactic and explicit. So it was really a, a battle. How explicit do we have to be? How implicit could I remain? As to my own, so, so that in that sense, um, the, the, the biographical elements were actually not coming from me, but they came from the producer, which is also a little bit ironic. So I had to make the film fit the genre of the family film, the, the autobiographical. Um, that the audience would have been accustomed to. Uh, as to my own uh, presence, um, yes, I, I was very keen not to have my face in it. So you have my back in the beginning, but you also have my back at the end. I don't know whether you saw that right back in the the postman color. There, there I am at the back. So that that was extremely explicit and deliberate. And uh, the shots of me as a baby, yes, they they seem to anchor it in a particular way, so I thought that was quite appropriate, but obviously that took, uh, took a little bit of self-persuasion to let go of that material. Thank you. Um, when I was watching the film, I felt like it was sad. Maybe everyone had different ideas, and because of my identification with it in certain points, I can tell that it's a sad film. And in relation to your experience and to your talk, I thought, oh, in, in which ways he wanted to make this film, and then I thought about the legacy of Martin Osius. So, what was your main motivation? Was it for his legacy? Was it for your family? Was it for yourself or the different kinds of audience? Well, it's a very good, a good question, which I can't really fully answer, other than to, to say that uh, it remains a tension, you know, the, the, the ostensible purpose of the film is to support and serve the purposes of the Martin Elsewhere Foundation. So that's the primary purpose. Um, what emerged for me in the process is that I became much more interested in my grandmother than I, than I was in my grandfather. So, so you could say that it's an homage to my grandmother who has completely vanished from not even fa not only family histories but any kind of public record. So when I came across those uh, love letters and the intensity not only of her devotion to this man but also the literary quality and that doesn't actually become that evident but you know, you see glimpses of it in the extracts that I've, uh, I'm quoting. Then I just thought it would be almost irresponsible not to make that person uh, a, a chief figure in, in the film. So, uh, as I was saying, the, 
the, the, the producers wanted a film about Frankfurt and about the, the, the central market and, and, and uh, the new Frankfurt and all that, especially in relation to the Bauhaus year coming up and, and various other public events uh, around it. I had only material, I mean material of any kind of value, if you like, about the island. So the 10 years that I spent on the, researching this film um, was, were often spent trying to stitch together these two stories. And it was actually by making it more and more personal that, that the stories eventually came together in some form. Um, the, the, the tenor of the film, yes, you're quite right that in the end, it's actually something of a family melodrama because uh, there are so many traumas that, that emerge. Uh, for instance, there's the trauma of my grandmother that she basically abandons a high bourgeois existence to live on an island without electricity, without running water, uh, mosquitoes and, and, and uh, you know, urban rubbish because basically uh, the island, as an experiment, was to recycle um, urban waste. And so, you know, there are letters about saying just how hard it was, and I quote some of them, but there are also very angry letters to Mika saying, why are you abandoning me here? Where are you? So, so there, there's a tragedy of her, and then losing this man uh, less than two years after she made that huge sacrifice for him. There's the tragedy of my mother, uh, who, uh, you know, didn't marry the man she really loved. Uh, there's a tragedy of my father, as well, marrying a woman who didn't want him. Um, and uh, uh, there's a tragedy of Miguel that he was never able to act fully implement um, those fantastic, those ideas that we now think are pretty fantastic and very revolutionary. So each of the characters has their own narrative, and I hope that sort of comes out a little bit, and whether that then makes it a sad film, I don't know, because in one sense, of course, it has a happy ending for Martin with his homecoming in the very place that ejected, rejected, and uh, um, persecuted him. So, so and, and, and the central irony of the film, the paradox is, that it's only because the European Central Bank's architect destroyed the building that we even have the story. If they hadn't done that, none of this would ever see the public, uh, you know, the public sphere. So I have to be, in a peculiar way, thankful to the European Central Bank for destroying the building. <laughs> We wouldn't even know that a film was, was possible, never mind that to realize that I'm realizing. So, so the, the, the project is full of these traumatic reversals or traumatic suspensions, but it's also based on this basic paradox that destruction can actually be a form of creation. That was, I found it very, very moving. Uh, but for me, the, 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 the moment was when you talk about your father being a filmmaker and never having read a word of your, your writing and you never having asked him, but by making the film, it all comes together. You acknowledge his filmmaking uh, and you, in a sense, you know, contribute to his life, maybe not through your writing, but through the film. So I was very touched by that element of the film. Yes, I mean, that, that, that was one way of making amends, yes, you know I mean? Um, obviously, like, like almost every a man, a young man, you know, I had my problems with my father. Um, but I don't know whether you noticed, but I actually thematized father-son relationships three times over. Um, there is a father-son relationship between uh, the, the philandering writer and, and his son, uh, who was already dead when he was born, uh, which means that when he saw him, when, when I showed him the footage, that was a very moving moment for him. And then I found a letter that my grandfather had written to my father saying, you're still hung up on your Oedipus complex and it's time that you really sorted this out. And then as with the scene that you, or, or the, uh, the commentary that you quoted, so you have three different ways of managing uh, father-son relationships. I was uh, curious about your uh other grandmothers, uh, Jewish grandmothers. Yes. I mean, we just catch glimpses of her 
Again, that was very deliberate not to make that story, you know, the classic Jewish story, take over the other one. So it had to be there, but it couldn't be dominant. And that is what some people then accused me of, that I didn't make that sense of story. But that was very deliberate. Is there more footage of her? There's no footage. There is, no there is an incredibly interesting story, but um, I don't have a film to go with it. <laughs> they didn't make films about concentration camps, as we know, nor indeed about the, the, the women's prison in Frankfurt, which is a very notorious place. Uh, hello, uh, you said that you made the t uh, film particularly for the television, so I imagine that there's some elements in the movie addressed for the public of the television and uh, what would have been the movie if you use another medium for, I don't know, as a documentary, for the art house cinema or, I don't know, maybe um, for installations or galleries, it would be different, what would you add, what would you... Um, but would you um, change in the um, themes or elements, visual or uh, audiovisual? I would have used the same material, and I hope my original essay film concept, namely of uh, rereading the film several times. You know that initially I remember them as home movies, and home movies, as Roger Rodin confirms. Uh, they are just bits and pieces. They don't have an author and they don't have a narrative arc. And that is their purpose, because they have to be sufficiently incoherent and random to allow members of the family to project themselves into it. And indeed, uh, on there is an interview, in the interview with my sister, uh, something I had to cut out, uh, she says, we watch these films over and over, and we already knew what was going to happen, and then we had little arguments about, you know, what was coming next or why that was important. So she actually confirms Audin's observation about home movies that they have to be, they have to be structuredly, you know, they have structured ambiguity or structured incoherence, if you like. And obviously, when you repurpose them the way that I I, I did, I narrativized this material. And I'm sure if had my father uh, sitting next to me, he would just shake his head and say, no, 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 that's not what it was at all. But that's the, uh, you know, the, the freedom. Well, I would say that's a constraint, not even the freedom, that's a constraint I was working under, that I was working, uh, you know, with, with, with professional producers who weren't interested in my family. They were interested in having a film uh, that, that got an audience. Um, but the, uh, the, the basic principle for me was the one that, that Howard Farocchi, for instance, uses in Aufschub, in Respite, where he shows the same footage several times, and you can see every time there's another layer to it, and, and they, they take on a completely new meaning. So what was home movies for us as children, then in, you know had these hidden traumas of my mother and my grandmother, and indeed my other grandmother as well, if you like, and they, they had this purpose of documenting Leberechtmiger's experiments. So you know, each layer referred to another part of German history. So what, what seemed totally, you know, within the family, gradually emerged as actually somewhat rewriting parts of German interwar history. And that was, that was the, the essay film would have made that more explicit, but I hope there's still enough there of that for people to see. So within this rather boring German television documentary, there is also the traces of my essay film. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, thank you for this wonderful film. Uh, seeing the Schmerbank in the film was a big surprise for me. Uh, Schmerbank is one of the symbolic buildings in Ankara, representing uh, early Republican period. period. I hope you have so many materials about uh, Schmerbank building, maybe. If you have, we can make another film, maybe. Yes. <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it for, for two reasons. One is that there is actually 
There's a little more on that. And there is a version of the film that also talks about uh, a cemetery that he built. And it's, and I can't pronounce it, Sebesis, something like that. Uh, a cemetery in, in Ankara. That's Martin El Sessa uh, laid that out. And it's a particularly interesting because it's a multi-denominational cemetery. And it, and it is, as, as uh, this morning we heard, cemeteries were parks, you know, it's, where there were public spaces. So the, 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 the Sebesi, uh, cemetery is, is used as a, as a kind of people's park as well. So, but there is no film. But I, I, could, I should have perhaps mentioned that uh, several years ago, I did actually write a piece about Martin Elsesser in Turkey. And it was published, that was published in, in a, a glossy Turkish magazine, in Turkish, uh, and it's a, the architect is called, whatever the, the Turkish word would be, is the name of the journal that published it. No, 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 it was a different, with M or something. Yeah. So, so yeah, there, there is more. I mean, the, the, the episode of my grandfather here in Turkey is very interesting, but the, the visual material, even the one that I, 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 I now have, took two years to get together these five or six photographs. So, um, you know, or, this is what one obviously doesn't realize when one sees the film. It looks as if it's all there, you know, I just had to pull it out and then put it in the film. But ten years, ten years of my life <laughs> to collect yes, this. Have material. you ever visited uh, Sumerbank building or Jebeji uh, cemetery? Sorry? Ankara? Have you ever visited? Yes, yeah. yes, of course, yes, yes. Uh, but, but the Sumer Bank is under threat. It's, it's no longer used as a bank. Uh, uh, the shops around it are dilapidated or derelict and uh, nobody knows what to do with it. So in a way, it's a little bit like the, the Gorsmarkhalle in Frankfurt. It's a, it's a sort of white elephant that, you know, Ankara doesn't quite know what to do with it, but doesn't quite dare to remove it altogether. So maybe this film helps to keep it uh, alive. Yeah. Do you ever have a something? It's a very moving film. Thank you for that. Uh, Thank you. I was actually going to ask what you did for 10 years, but you already said that you're finding material. Uh, so, I'm kind of curious about, uh, since you've written so much about essay films and, you know, the form is already uh, more than familiar, so when you uh, engage with the material, because often filmmakers and artists say that it's an organic process, the material speaks to them and then the form, you know, emerges from immersing into that material, but you had a predetermined notion of how, how you want to treat it. Um, which you couldn't realize because of the producer. So I'm wondering whether at any point you changed, other than the producer's uh, pressure, was there anything that emerged from the material that made you change your um, film? Yeah, no, but let, let me be clear. It, although there were, there were some really um, hard discussions, I in the end, I think it's a better film that I actually listen to my producer. I think, um, I, I know I'm not Chris Marker, and I also know I'm not Howard Faraki. So, so to have the genre of the German television, have the genre of the family film and all that, was actually a help in the end. It gave it a structure. So even though as a film a scholar, I'm more interested in non-linear forms of narration, uh, I was very happy that I was with a team that actually knew how to tell a story in linear terms. So it's not as if I now reclaim some kind of uh, uh, auteur modi, you know, the classic auteurism, uh, fighting against the producer, fighting against the system. Not at all. So, so that was an important learning curve. First of all, to realize that if you're working for television, Forget about authorship. If you're the writer, even if you're the director, it's the, it's the institution um, that has the last word. The producer is really the one that puts the stamp on it. So, so that was a valuable lesson. But one that I was actually very keen to learn, both as, a, as somebody making a film, but also as a scholar, that I realized that our auteur theory really needs to, need to be balanced against uh, some of the... Um, the, the, the practical dynamics of 
making a film that actually then is shown to an audience. But uh, as far as, well, maybe I should mention one thing. Um, the producer really wanted to have images of Berlin burning and in ruins, and he wanted images of Berlin under Nazi rule with, with uh, swastikas in the streets and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Siegessäule surrounded by uh, Nazi flags and so on. And that's where I said, over my dead body, that's not going to happen. So I had to give them a seminar on what it means to make an aesthetic choice uh, that is an aesthetic constraint. And I said, the only constraint I'm really putting on our collaboration is that all the material in the film is either shot by us, that is by me and the team, or comes from my father's archive. Nothing else is permitted. So that was pretty tough. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the only reason where I really had to uh, be very uh, strict and uh, um, stick my neck out. May I add one thing? Because uh, Professor Chekichan pointed out that Sumerbank building is now Ankara Social Bilimler University. I wasn't sure when I saw it, but I happened to go to the university for a conference, and I'm now checking the pictures. It's a university now. It's a university? Yes, because it was under construction, uh -huh. restoration, and now Ankara Social Bilimler University is oh, right. having one well, of the faculties, yeah, and I, I wasn't sure. Visited again. It, yeah, was, yeah. it was I about 10 pictures. years ago that I visited it. Yeah. Just to validate. Well, thank you for the information. Very interesting. I was wondering uh, whether you kept the preparations of the films deliberately, yes. and is this a, is this a reference yes. to the okay. materiality? All right, all right, very good. Thank you for <laughs> giving me the cue to talk about that. That was a matter of some controversy, because the the, the cameraman I used to film on the island was a man called Ingo Kratisch, and Ingo Kratisch is both a filmmaker in his own right and he is the cameraman for almost every film that Harwin Faraki made. And Harwin Faraki and Ingo Kratisch are purists. They, they come out of the Jean-Marie Straub school of filmmaking, if that means something to you. And he was absolutely shocked when he saw that we were using the, the frame edge. And uh, I had to explain, that, but we, we had internally, I mean obviously Ingo wasn't involved anymore, so he, in the editing process, because, so he only saw that when the film was done, um, and, and almost through his name he was so outraged by it, because he said that is never how your father saw the image. So if you want to be truthful to the filmmaker, and you say so much about the filmmaker, then putting the edge frame into it is actually betraying uh, the filmmaker and your father. Now, the, the television producer was saying, we must have this, because otherwise people will think there's something wrong with our television set, because it's in black and white, and because it's all grainy. So it had to have the marker of archive footage. And the easiest way to make that clear, that it was celluloid and archive material, is to put this, uh, the, uh, the perforation into it. I personally then thought, Okay, I'm between these two camps, but how I rationalized my decision to keep it in was to say that I actually gained uh, one-fifth of a frame, and there, there are stuff now visible, there are even people now visible, that wouldn't, I wouldn't have known, I wouldn't have recognized without it. So there's, for instance, a scene where my maternal grandmother sort of leans back when my other grandmother holds the fish towards her, and that shock leaning back we wouldn't see if we didn't have that little bit of extra. So there were some benefits in making that compromise, yes. Did it bother you? Or was no, no, it? I was enjoying it. Uh -huh. I, I think we do enjoy, we enjoy it as a kind of authenticity effect, yeah, but, but I, it is I, I, I <laughs> it is not authentic enough. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but well, that's part of it. You know, I mean that, I I I I did have a lot of rationalizations that made me reasonably uh, comfortable with the decision. 
So I think we can talk forever, but uh, you know, uh, thank you all very much yeah. for the